tired, so tired from walking, and Lord, I'm so alone, and Lord, the dark is creeping in, it's creeping up to swallow me, I think I'll stop, rest here a while, and this is all that I can say right now. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Church Online. Glad to have you with us today for this. My name's Andy Beatty. I'm the teaching minister here at Central Christian Church in Mount Vernon. Uh, and we're in our second week of the series that we're calling Blessed. And, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to take how we kind of typically think of the word blessed and look at it in a deeper, more spiritual, more intimate way. Because last week we talked about kind of how when we think of the word blessed, typically we think of two things. We think of health and we think of wealth. Um, last week we discussed the idea of being blessed to be an evangelist, to share the gospel and how that's really a blessing. It was, it's so cool, as I've been at football this week, uh, hearing our football players over and over and over take the approach of the Samaritan woman, which hopefully you remember her approach was simple. It was like, hey, come and see. Come, come check it out. And it's been really cool to see those football players inviting other football players to church or encouraging them to go, church, go to church and check it out. Today, though, we're going to talk about a different type of blessing. We're going to talk about the blessing of a burden. Okay, the blessing of a burden. That's not something we would typically think of as being a blessing. 
Because a burden is something that weighs us down. It's something that slows us up. Or maybe it's something that makes uh, someone or something difficult to deal with. I remember when I first got diagnosed with MS a little over two years ago, I had this real fear of being a burden to Jill and to my family and to my friends and those close to me. It scared me. I didn't want to be a burden. I didn't want to slow them down, weigh them down and make it where they had to take care of me over and over. And that's kind of the, the earthly way of viewing a burden. That's kind of how we typically view a burden. It's something that slows us down or something that weighs us down. But I want to encourage you that a burden can be a blessing. A burden can be something that weighs on us so much that we can't not take action. It spurs us on to action. I kind of think of it like my son, uh, Silas. He is a, an ornery little fella. He's, he's the youngest, uh, and he spent a lot of time with me as Jill started working when he was about two or three years old. And so he spent a lot of time with me coming to church. Uh, if, if I've ever visited you in your house for the last couple of years, there's a really good chance Silas was with me. He tagged along with me. And as a result, Jill seems to think maybe he's a little more mischievous than the other two. Um, people think that Silas is the quiet one. No. <laughs> No, it's the quiet ones you got to watch out for. He's ornery, he's mischievous, he has a great sense of humor. I love that Silas has no fear of crowds. Uh, he has no fear of people or new situations. He has this confidence inside him uh, that just makes me beam with pride. Uh, he doesn't really uh, get overwhelmed uh, by, by you know, large crowds or new situations at all. And so when I, when I think about like the blessing of a burden, there's something that Silas does a lot that kind of like to me just illustrates how we should view the blessing of a burden. Uh, occasionally at our house, uh, we'll have what we call a dance party, right? The kids, you know, they just got some energy they need to burn off. And so we'll turn on our Google Home or on the TV, we'll put on some YouTube videos and we'll start getting some music going, right? And it's so cool because at first you can, you can kind of just like see, see Silas at first. His head starts bopping with the music. You know, it's like he can feel the music and he just can't, you know, his head starts bopping. Then he starts bouncing around just a little bit. Pretty soon his hips are swaying as he's bopping and doing his thing. And next thing you know, he's full on breakdancing in the middle of our living room, just going crazy with his amazing, uh, amazing dance skills. It's almost like he just couldn't resist it any longer. The music hits him, it goes down into his soul, and he's just got to respond to the music. I love worshiping with him. Uh, so occasionally they'll come to first service, and he'll be in the worship service with me, and man, he's just clapping and swaying. He's just feeling, he's got this burden that he's got to move when there's music coming on. And that's what the blessing of a burden should do. It should hit you somewhere deep down, and it's going to cause you to move. It's going to stir you. It's going to make it so you can't just sit still and do nothing. I hope that it changes you. It stirs you. Just like when, you know, for Silas, when that music comes on and he can't hold back, he's got to do something. My hope for you with this message today is that it's going to cause you to recognize the blessing of a burden in your life. And I, and I hope that the Holy Spirit makes it so you can't ignore it any longer. I guess in short, what I'm hoping is that you have a Silas moment. Uh, if, if I were to put a phrase to it, I would say that's what I, I want you to have a Silas moment where you can't just sit still and be content, but you are spurred to action. So to do that, let's dive into the text here together. And we're going to look in the book of Nehemiah. So if you have a Bible or a phone that you're using, you can look at Nehemiah. We're going to look at chapter one, verse one. All right, the events recorded, recorded in this book, if you're using a real Bible, you'll kind of see they're actually in the middle to the front of the Bible, uh, but they actually take place some thousand years after the time of Moses and only about 400 years before the birth of Jesus. Okay, so chronologically, that's kind of where we're at. We're actually much closer to the birth of Jesus than we are the events happening in the Old Testament here. But during this time, uh, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, they're in a pretty rough state. They're in a rough situation. Their nations had been destroyed. The city of Jerusalem had been conquered by the Babylonians. And this once glorious temple that Solomon built had been destroyed. 
The Babylonians conquered Jerusalem. They deported almost everyone from the city and the region out. So imagine for almost 70 years, this, this big, powerful hub, this centerpiece of everything Jerusalem now is basically a ghost town. It's well on its way to end up like many other ancient cities, basically forgotten, basically forgotten in time. All of the Jewish people had been deported to Babylon, and they had begun to kind of make themselves home in those foreign lands there. They settled down, and it's really cool to see how many of them still followed the God of their fathers. They still followed Yahweh, even in this foreign land, this anti-God land. And it's so incredibly powerful to read some of the examples during this time of how people lived for God in a foreign land. And I think that, that we can draw a lot of experiences from that, right? As we're living for God, and this world is not our home. They were able to keep their faith. And you can read examples of people like Daniel. You know, we know the story of Daniel and the lions and all the incredible stuff that he did and how he was so different from the world. We can read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? And how the culture was telling, hey, you got to bow down and worship this king. And they're like, no, we worship God. They're in this foreign land doing this. This is not where they were supposed to be. They were exiles. Uh, you can read about Esther during this time. Made, a, made a, a powerful woman, a queen in the courts of a Persian king. Put in a place to do something big in a moment like this in a foreign land. But here's where we pick up. After 70 years of exile, 70 years of captivity in Babylon, they're finally given the opportunity to return, to return back to their homeland, to the promised land, to Jerusalem. You know, you'd think they'd be jumping at it, right? Like, yeah, we finally get to go back. Well, out of roughly, historians estimate, two to three million Jews had been deported from that area. They estimate that only about 50,000 decided to return back to the promised land. That's like 2% of the people. But they did return. And in the days of Ezra, so if you look in your Bible, Ezra is right before Nehemiah. Uh, in the days of Ezra, they rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the, the temple and they laid a spiritual foundation for Israel once again. This book of Nehemiah begins about 15 years after the book of Ezra ends. And it's really very much viewed as like a brother book. Like they go hand in hand. Like it could be Ezra 1 and Ezra 2. Or Nehemiah 1 and Nehemiah 2. They go hand in hand. Actually some biblical scholars contend that they initially started as one book and then were separated. But I want you to keep in mind that this book is written about a hundred years. After the captives from Babylon had come back to the promised land. About 150 years after Jerusalem, the city had been destroyed. So that's kind of our timeline. 150 years prior to this, Jerusalem destroyed. 100 years prior to this, they had come back to the promised land. And yet, after all that time still, the walls of the city were still in rubble. And if you're familiar with the history, you know, you know the book of Ezra, the temple was rebuilt, then the Torah, the Jewish law was taught, community was built by Ezra, uh, but they had not been able to rebuild the walls after all this time. The walls, the city gate, they still lay in ruins. But it wasn't for lack of trying. See, we can, you can read in Ezra about the opposition they faced rebuilding the wall 75 years before that. No one thought the walls could be rebuilt or the gates could be rebuilt. So they just, they just laid in ruins. And as a result, the people stayed, remained in trouble. It wasn't an ideal situation. It wasn't a safe situation. It wasn't a situation where if you were living in exile and you heard about this, that you might not be jumping at the opportunity to go back to it. And that's where we pick up in Nehemiah chapter 1, starting with verse 1. He says, these are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Antiochus reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. Okay, so right off the bat here, in Nehemiah 1.1, we see that Nehemiah lived in the capital city of the Persians. And not only that, he lived in a fortified palace. He lived in the palace of the Persian king. So right away, we get this feeling and this understanding that Nehemiah is someone important. He's living in the palace of, a, of the king of Persia. He goes on, Han and I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. So his body's in Persia, right? But his heart, his burden, his mind is some 800 miles away with the people of Jerusalem. You know, and it would be easy to read about a man like Nehemiah. 
Nehemiah was an important person. He was living in a distant land. And it would be easy to think, well, he's probably too important to concern himself with those problems. With people he's never met, with a city he's probably never been to. Yet his heart was for the things of God. His heart was aligned with God. And we can see very early on here the blessing of a burden. He felt a strong calling, a pulling, that gravitational pull that we talked about last week. He felt it towards his people. He felt it towards the things that matter to God. And so in verse 3, he writes, They said to me, things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. They say they are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Now it's easy kind of in our context to hear this and think, well, what's the big deal? Right? Like, what, what's the big deal here? Build some more walls. Like, come on, you know, stop, stop complaining about it, build some walls. Or, or just go without walls. Well, in the ancient culture, uh, a city without walls was, was completely open and vulnerable to its enemies. And you didn't just build, like, a little six-foot wall. Like, hey, we built a wall. No, we're talking massive, huge, thick walls. They were to serve as your main source of defense and protection. And so a city without a wall was a city without any defense or any protection. An unwalled city was kind of like a backwater town. It could have nothing valuable in it. You wouldn't take all your best stuff, everything you have, and just put it in a backwater town. No, you'd want it fortified. You'd want it secured. Because if there was anything anything valuable in an unwalled city well, then it was probably very easily going to be stolen away because there was no defense to stop it. And so, yeah, they rebuilt the temple years earlier, and you can read about that in Ezra. They rebuilt the temple, and they were trying to live there, but it wasn't safe. Those living in an unwalled city lived in this constant stress, this constant tension. They never knew when they might be attacked. They never knew when that attack would be just like a brutal attack. As a result, every man was living in fear for his wife and children. The temple could be rebuilt, but it wasn't the way they wanted to rebuild it. It couldn't really be made beautiful because anything of value could be taken easily from it because there's no walls. So yeah, they're home, they're in their promised land, but they're living in constant fear. They're living in constant distress. They're living in constant disgrace. They're just getting by as survivors. And see, here's the thing. God has more for us than to just be mere survivors. God not only wants us to be conquerors, but he wants us to be more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so Nehemiah hears about this terrible news, this troubling news about his own people, and we see the burden that God places on him. We see in verse 4 how hard it hits him. Look at Nehemiah 1.4. He writes, When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. God was going to use Nehemiah to do something about this situation. But first, God had to do something in Nehemiah. Any great work of God begins with God doing a great work in somebody first. God was blessing Nehemiah with a burden that would help many people. And see, God prepared this long ago with Nehemiah's important position in Persia, with a heart curious about the people of Jerusalem and their welfare. We see that he had a broken heart over their needy state. See, God saw the need in heaven, but little would be done until the right man also felt the need. God would do something great to meet that need through Nehemiah. And so that's how we see a burden can be a blessing. And so I ask you, what has God put on your heart? What does your heart break for? What are you concerned about? I love our church family, and I love hearing the stories of people in this church who have a burden for something. Whether it's getting healthy food out to the people in our community, maybe it's supporting the crisis pregnancy center starting point here in town, maybe it's picking up an elderly neighbor and bringing them to church, maybe, maybe it's something totally unique or something that I've not heard about. But I love hearing those stories. And so I would ask you, what is it that God has placed on your heart? We're going to do something a little different, because what I fear right now is that our human tendencies, the flesh kind of talks us out of acknowledging the things that are important to God. Right? It's kind of like this, well, my heart would break for students in foster care, 
But that's a little too time consuming and I, I can't really do that and so we just totally dismiss it. Or my heart would break for the homeless, but the flesh, our mind, the world tells us, well, they probably deserve it. It's probably their fault, right? My, my heart would break for this or that, but our flesh talks us out of it. And perhaps maybe what's even more scary is to stop and try to think about the thing that, you're, that, that God has placed a burden on your heart for. Try to stop and think about a thing that God has a burden for you. What's even more scary is when you feel nothing. You don't feel that burden at all. So I ask you, seriously consider what breaks your heart. The fact that there are millions all over the world with no clean drinking water. The fact that our culture is permeated with unwed moms or wed moms who are dealing with raising kids on their own because we have a, gentleman, or a generation of men that want to be boys instead of spiritual Christian leaders in their home. Maybe your heart breaks for racism. Maybe it's corrupt politicians. Maybe God has put a burden on your heart for at-risk teens. I want to ask you to take a moment and ask yourself, what is it that breaks my heart? See, the rest of this message will go nowhere if there's not some realization on your part that God has put a burden in your life. God has blessed you with a burden. This message will be a lot like a train leaving a station with no one on it unless we first identify the burden that God has placed on our heart. The Bible is full of people who felt the blessing of a burden and acted. Sometimes they acted in foolish ways, in hindsight. Sometimes they acted reluctantly. But the Bible is full of people who felt the blessing of a burden. You can read about the shepherd boy David who went to visit his brothers and had no business facing this Philistine giant. But he was blessed with a burden and upset by a Philistine mocking his God. He was blessed with a burden and did something about it. You can think about Moses. He was angry about how his people were being treated. And yet he sinned in his anger and then went into hiding as he killed that guy for abusing his people. But then he was faced with the blessing of a burden later when God came to him as that burning bush and said, hey, you need to come save my people. And what did he do? He pushed back. He pushed back. He had excuses after excuses. But God eventually used him in amazing ways. I think about Abraham being blessed with a burden for the people of Sodom. You know, God, if there's just 50 people there, will you save them? God, if there's 45 people there, will you save them? All the way down, God, if you just find 10 righteous people, will you save them? He was blessed with a burden for those people. I think about Esther. God placed a burden on, on, on her for, for his people. And he put her in a position to do something about it. I think about Noah, blessed with the burden of building an ark, being mocked by people, but saving mankind from the flood. I think about Dorcas, who we talked about last week, blessed with the burden of seeing the need of widows of her day, and not just helping them to survive the day to day, but to see something bigger. I think about Mary, who felt the burden to worship Jesus despite what everybody was going to say about her, think about her, talk about her. She didn't care how it looked. She felt the blessing of a burden to worship Jesus, and she poured the pure nard on the feet of Jesus and worshiped him. So what have you been blessed with? What burden have you been blessed with? What makes you angry? What makes you burn with righteous anger? What breaks your heart? What do you care about that maybe other people don't care about? I want to encourage you to name it. I want to encourage you to name it. I want you to write it down. Find a spot to write down, what has God blessed you with? Write down, I am burdened by, and fill in the blanks. My hope and prayer is that you'll take time to do that as you're watching this. And I hope that God does a big and probably uncomfortable work in you and allows you to see this burden as a blessing. That he allows you to see a different way of viewing this. Take time to do that. Write down what your burden is. Now, I'm assuming you've taken time to do that. You can pause this if you need to. Isn't that the beautiful thing of these recordings, right? Uh, is we're not really limited by time here in the church building. So if you haven't yet, pause it, pray, think about it. What has God blessed you with as a burden? Now ask yourself this, what do we do with this? 
Well, first, understand that God has blessed you with something. It is a blessing to have this burden from God. He's trusting you to make a kingdom, kingdom impact in this area. And so we're going to talk about what we do with this. But first, I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the wrong ways to deal with this. Because here's how a lot of people handle the burdens of the, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of people love to complain about them, right? Wah, wah, wah. It's always someone else's fault. The government's out to get me. My boss hates me. Yeah, I show up late to work, and I'm unprepared, and I'm really distracted, and I don't get my work done in a professional way. But yeah, he's really out to get me. He really, man, he just won't advance me. As a football coach, you know, I hate hearing like, oh, my coach doesn't like me. He won't play me. I don't have the right name. I'm not this. I'm not that. It's like, yeah, well, you don't watch film. You don't study your scouting report. You don't know the plays. You don't listen to the coaching. You're not changing what you're doing. You're not giving consistent effort in everything you do. So, yeah, he's probably annoyed with you, not out to get you. But people just love to complain. It's the school's fault. They don't teach the kids right. Man, can you believe this construction? This is taking forever. They don't know how to pave a road. This church, it's terrible. Their minister is not funny. He's way too obsessed with Bigfoot. The music is too loud. The coffee's too bitter. The lights are too bright. They don't do anything I want. My house is too cold. I can't get over this. Why are they doing that? To the people who love to complain all the time, I would just really respectfully like to say to them, shut up. Just shut up. Quit your whining. Quit complaining. Some people just love to complain, though, don't they? Kind of like I like complaining about complainers. So what does that say about me? But that's not a healthy response to the burden that God has put on your heart, is to just complain about it. Another inappropriate response is to ignore it. If God has blessed you with a burden, don't ignore it. Oh, I'll just bury my head in the sand. Yeah, oh, I, hate, I hate hearing this on the news or I hate reading about this because it just breaks my heart. So I'm just going to ignore it completely. I'm just going to take those emotions and press them down. Right? That's not an appropriate response either. Another faulty approach people have is to just appease it. Right? It's like where people feel really bad about something and so they figure out what's the least amount I can do to still feel okay about this. Yeah, my heart breaks for, you know, teens in a crisis pregnancy situation. Here's $2. Hey, everybody, look, I'm giving $2. That'll make me feel better, right? Maybe next year I'll give five because I'm just a super generous guy. Is that the least I can do to not feel that anymore? Please recognize that if God is blessing you with a burden, he wants you to do something with it. A burden may not always feel like a blessing, but we are kingdom-minded people. We're not meant to live in this world. We are kingdom-minded. A burden from God is a blessing from God. And so if you feel that, and I hope you do, understand you have been blessed. So what do we do when we experience the blessing of a burden? Well, first off, it's really easy. Allow yourself to feel the burden. Let it overwhelm you. Let it ruin you. Let it devastate you. Nehemiah didn't ignore the burden, did he? It would have been easy for him to say, well, that's not my problem. That's 800 miles away. I'm living in this fortress here. I'm clearly very important. That's someone else's issue. But he didn't do any of that, did he? And said he heard about it, he felt the weight of it. And if you look at verse 4 of Nehemiah chapter 1, he says, When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Ask yourself, how long has it been since the problems of this world actually bothered you? I would encourage you, I would encourage everyone, myself included, to expose our lives to the things that break the heart of God. Don't hide from reality. Learn about the nitty-gritty stuff happening here in Knox County. Learn about the homeless issues. Learn about Starting Point. Discover the truth about the sanctity of life and not just what someone else has told you. Align your heart with God. Allow Him to bless you with a burden. Allow it to ruin you. Allow yourself to feel it. I want to share with you uh, the blessing of a burden that, that God has blessed me with. And, and God has really just been overwhelming me. He, and, and, you know, in a lot of ways, I feel like he's kind of like ruining me. You know, like, it's just like, it seems like every time I'm like, oh, okay, like everything's fine. God's like, no, 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 no. And I just, I have to feel it and embrace it. 
But I have been in vocational ministry for 12 years now. I've been in full-time ministry for 10 years. And I don't know that I've ever felt a bigger burden than I have now. Maybe it's just because 2020, and I'm pretty sure the world's going to end soon. If nothing else, our world is going to end very soon. Uh, 2020 has just like made everything crazy. And so maybe that's some of the burden. But my burden is for the church. And I'm talking the capital C church, like, like the church, not just central Christian church, but, but, but Christ's church overall. I fear that too many Christians in churches all over the world just want to be comfortable. What's the least I can do and still get to heaven? How can I live a burden-free life yet still experience the blessings of God? Yeah, yeah, I, I love church as long as the pastor is funny and brief. Uh, I love church as long as the music fits my style. Yeah, I love church as long as everyone's nice to me and makes over me. And so maybe I'll come back if they kind of ooh and all over me. But don't ask me to serve his kingdom. Don't ask me to serve those kiddos. No way am I touching those snot-nosed snot little kids. No way am I helping those teenagers, right? They may be texting about me behind my back, right? I want to be blessed, but, but not hurt, but not stretched, but not challenged, but not moved. I just want to be a comfortable Christian. My hope and prayer, my burden, is I hope that, that God completely overwhelms you. I pray that he ruins you. I, I pray that you feel it like Nehemiah felt it. I pray that you have that unshakable feeling, like that toothache. And that toothache that's just always there, no matter what. And that you can't get rid of it. I pray that he takes the church out of its comfort zone. I pray that just like it did to Nehemiah, it ruins us. It overwhelms us. It spurs us forward. And here's where we see where it spurred us forward. Okay, we talked about letting it overwhelm us. The second point here is it should overwhelm us to a point where it draws us closer to God. Look at verse 4. Look at what he did. He says, I, when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. There's two important things we see here in the text. He fasted and he prayed. He didn't just sit around and cry about this and do nothing. Oh, I could so just sit here and cry, right? Like, no, in fact, we see that he took a lot of action. But first, he aligned his heart with God and drew even closer to him. Instead of saying, God, why are you doing this? God, you're making me so mad. God, how could, God you must not be real if this is happening. Instead, it drew him closer. He aligned even more with God. And he did it with fasting and with prayer. Fasting is something we find in both Testaments. Uh, what is fasting? Typically, we think of fasting as abstaining from food, right? And that's probably the most common way of viewing fasting. But really, what is fasting? Fasting is denying the flesh and feeding the spirit. That's what fasting is. It's denying the flesh and feeding the spirit. But we usually do the opposite, don't we? We feed the flesh over and over and over, and we deny the spirit. So often we go days and days and days without feeding the spirit, and we don't think anything of it. But if we miss a meal, man, that's all we can think about. That's all we can talk about. Oh, I left my phone at home today. I can't believe this. I'm denying myself the phone for today. It's no wonder that we're often spiritually overwhelmed as we battle against the evil of this world. Because we've reversed the roles. We're feeding our fleshly desire all the time, and yet we're fasting from the Spirit. It should be the other way. Fasting reverses those roles. We feed the Spirit as we deny the flesh. Thus the Spirit becomes stronger and more powerful, and our fleshly desires become weaker. And so there's a lot of different ways to view fasting. But you should fast from things that feed the flesh. You should fast from TV. You should fast from the political shows. You should fast from your phone. <laughs> yeah, that would probably be a lot harder for most of us than giving up food, right? A lot of us would probably rather fast from food than give up our phone. I challenge you to fast from your phone. Do it like a half a day. Start with half a day. Choose a day. Fast from your phone. And during that time, feed the Spirit. Draw close to God during that time. You can fast from certain foods like Daniel did. You can fast a meal uh, for a day or for three days or for a week. But what it is, is it's a, it's a deliberate and concerted effort to weaken my flesh and strengthen my spirit. Take that time while you are fasting to pray. 
Take the approach Nehemiah did. He was heartbroken. He felt it. He felt the blessing of a burden. He was overwhelmed. And he stopped feeding his fleshly desires. And he fed his spirit. And he drew close to God. Draw close to him. Be honest. Be open. Seek wisdom. The third lesson when blessed with a burden is to let it move you to action. The story of Nehemiah, if you read on, it goes on that the king notices that, that he is distraught, that Nehemiah is upset. And Nehemiah makes this bold request in Nehemiah 2.5. He says, if it pleases the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. Send me. He let the burden overwhelm. He drew close to God, and now he's moved to action. So if you come to church sometime, and you're like, you know what, the people there aren't very friendly, guess what? You just became a greeter. <laughs> you, you just became a greeter. You just got enrolled to be nice to people. You felt a burden, and now you need to do something about it. Hey, you know, yeah, man, there's so many young people around here. They're just all over the place. Who's helping these kids out? Guess what? You just signed up to help teach a class. God gave you a burden. You feel it. You draw close to him. Now you need to do something with it. Man, all these new believers, we had all those people baptized a few weeks ago. Who's helping raise them? Who's helping disciple them? You. God just gave you that burden, didn't he? Why do you think you care? And maybe the people around you don't. God's blessed you with a burden. Where's the deeper Bible study, Andy? You know, you're a funny guy. You've got a beautiful family. You're likable enough, but you're not a deep Bible teacher. Okay. Okay. Then lead one. Lead one. Do it. Gather 12 people. Gather people together. It's your burden. Do something with it. That's what Nehemiah did. He said, send me. Send me. That's what many great Christians have done for thousands and thousands of years. They were moved to action. And they said, send me. I'll do it. I'll embrace the blessing of the burden. Isaiah, when confronted by the Lord, asking, who shall I send? Who's going to be our messenger? Who's going to go do this? Who will go for us? His response, not suppression, not uh, push that down. His response, not excuses, not appeasement. He didn't ignore it. Some of my most favorite words in all of scripture, Isaiah chapter six, verse eight, he responded, here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. You can love me or hate me, but church family, here's what I'm praying for you. I pray that God reveals a burden to you. I pray that burden overwhelms you, that it ruins you, that you feel it in the deepest way possible. I have been praying and I will continue to pray that you find discomfort at the fake relationships of this world. I have been praying, I will continue to pray that the easy answers that our world offers, the half truths, they make you uneasy. They make you sick to your stomach. I pray that this happens so that you can live a deeper life, so that you can live a new life. I pray that God blesses you with anger at injustice or oppression or exploitation of people. I pray that God blesses you with tears. I pray that God blesses you with a broken heart for people who are in pain, for people who are suffering, for people who are rejected or forgotten. I pray that you're bold enough to reach out and do something. I pray that you get out of your comfort zone and turn people's hurting into joy, that you point them to the Savior that we have. I pray that God blesses you with confidence to believe that you can make a difference in this world and do what others claim cannot be done. I pray that you have the blessing of a burden and that it's heavy and that you can't ignore it. And when you feel that and you embrace it, I pray that you draw close to God and then I pray, just like Nehemiah, just like Isaiah, just like every example we have through Scripture, I pray when you feel that blessing of a burden, that you're moved to action.
to the masses He is God Shout it Go on scream it from the mountain Go on tell it to the Yeah.